Well, thanks a lot for inviting me to come, and thanks to KCASH for inviting me. I had heard that this was one of the world's great eye centers, and I'm even more impressed than I expected. This is really a wonderful institution here. Um, Don asked me if I would talk about some of our clinical trials, uh, and in particular, a couple of our corneal ulcer trials that we've done in the last few years. Those are called Scott and Mott. I'll, I'll uh, tell you about them in detail. Uh, there, I really don't have any personal disclosures, but I should note that the drugs were pretty much donated for all these studies and that the NIH paid for uh, both of these studies. So when we're faced with this, you, you all see this more frequently than we do, these uh, bad central ulcers. Um, there, there's still a problem. The WHO, every 10 years or so, ranks the leading causes of blindness. And this is from the 90s, you'll see. Obviously, cataract was way up there. Trachoma was second back then. I think that was probably ranked a little higher than it was in 1993, but it certainly was common. Corneal ulcers, depending on how you, whether it's monocular or binocular blindness, but corneal ulcers came in fourth in 1993. You go ahead about 10 years later, when Serge Resnikoff did another list for the WHO, cataract, glaucoma, AMD. The infectious causes of blindness, like trachoma, leprosy, onchocerciasis, are all either going away or going way down. You can see trachoma and onchocerciasis are now at the bottom. But look at corneal ulcers, most of which are infectious. It's still number four. So let's go ahead about 10 more years when uh, Silvio Mariotti did a list for the WHO in 2010. Cataract, glaucoma, AMD, corneal ulcers number four. So we're much better with the other infectious diseases than we are with corneal ulcers. And um, there are reasons for that. We'll go through some of those. But also, we're, let's see if we can figure out a way to do a little better with corneal ulcers. There, I'm going to talk a little bit about the epidemiology quickly. There are not many incident studies. Incident studies are really difficult to do because uh, these are almost trauma. People go into their local doctors. They don't go into one center. You'd have to do a large population-based study to get the incidence. They have been done a few times. There may be a few more in the literature, but these are the ones I'm most familiar with. Three are in areas of uh, South Asia that are very agricultural. And you can see Nepal, India, and Bhutan that the incidence is uh, an order of magnitude more than it is in Minnesota and California, where it's mostly industrialized. Now, I'm going to first, in the beginning, talk about bacterial ulcers, and then the second half talk about fungal ulcers. With bacterial ulcers, every location has a different proportion of uh, different bacteria. And it, it, we used to think, oh, places got completely different organisms. But this is just an example. Here's Aravind Eye Hospital from way south India, and Proctor Validation from uh, San Francisco, way in the north. And you'll notice a few things. There's more pneumococcus uh, in, uh, at Aravind. Um, nocardia is 4% there, which seems a little bit surprising. But then you look a little more carefully, and nine out of the 10 organisms at Aravind, top 10, are found at the Proctor Foundation. And of course, vice versa, nine out of the 10 that are found in San Francisco are also found in South India. Uh, Proteus was barely made the list at Aravind and didn't make it at Proctor. And serratia, we actually see not uncommonly in San Francisco, but for some reason they never see in South India. But basically, we're all seeing the same organisms, just different proportions of them, which makes me think this disease, bacterial keratitis, is not really different in different parts of the world. There's a slightly different uh, pattern of organisms, but it's really roughly the same organisms. So our problem with bacterial keratitis is uh, I've heard people say we have 95% success. What they mean is they kill that, that they can kill the organism before perforation. Uh, unfortunately, some surveys show that a quarter of people end up with vision in that eye of less than 2,200. So uh, that is not a very successful procedure. As a matter of fact, there have been, if you look at the presentation acuity and the final acuity with bacterial corneal ulcers, it's really discouraging how poor our treatment is. What interventions can we do? Well, you can think of a lot of things. Uh, antimicrobials, obviously, immune modulators, um, and in particular, uh, steroids. Surgery, you could do early, DALC if you want. Cross-linking, uh, I know Don Stone's interested in that. And um, prevention. The, 
what's discouraging though is if you look at the corneal ulcer RCTs that have had more than 50 patients, uh, there may be more than this, but these are the ones we came up with. Uh, different antimicrobials, different number of patients. They were, some were bacteria, some were fungus, some were acanthamoeba. Uh, but the results were all no significant difference. So that really means when we're comparing different antimicrobial regimens, we're not seeing major differences. While we should look for new antimicrobials and new ways to provide them, we may have to look for a, a we're not going to get a miracle, I don't think, out of changing the antimicrobial. So what about immune modulators, and in particular steroids? That would be the easy one to use. Yes, it's nonspecific, but it's very strong. Uh, that's what I'd like to talk about. And I'd like to just preface the talk to remind people of the levels of evidence. We talked a little bit about this, I think, Monday morning. This is the Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine. There are other lists that are similar. But what they have in common is that it starts with expert opinion, and then there can be case series and cohort, and then RCT. And interestingly, RCT is not at the top. You need to have multiple RCTs to show something for it really to be the highest level of evidence. Um, but let's start with expert opinion. So we, a, lot, a number of people uh, have asked whether steroids are good. Uh, let's start with one expert, Duke Elder. Uh, should we use steroids to control the deleterious aspects of the inflammatory response until causative agent is eliminated? It seems rational. He said this is about a year after steroids were uh, introduced into humans, so it was fairly quickly before thinking about it for bacterial keratitis. Dennis O'Day, um, certainly an expert from Vanderbilt, uh, he said institutions lined up on either side in a major controversy of whether you should use steroids for bacterial ulcers. It does not seem like a major controversy now. Evidently, it was in 1969. Interestingly, the Proctor Foundation, where Don was and where I am, uh, was on the anti-steroids completely. Uh, more recently, at the Castro Viejo Society, 1995, they asked the audience, polled the audience, two-thirds said they used steroids. And by the way, I don't mean after the organism is killed. I mean while the organism is still probably present. Two-thirds used steroids. And then a couple years later, at the Ocular Microbiology and Immunology Group, it was four to one used steroids. So it seems like it might not be quite the controversy it used to be once we get into about 1997. We decided to uh, do a trial. It, interestingly, at Proctor, we were just starting to use steroids, and our friends at Aravind in South India absolutely refused to use steroids. They thought it was um, uh, unethical to. Uh, we started this trial. It's funded by the NIH, 500 patients, multi-center, placebo-controlled RCT. Um, when the trial was announced, some of our uh, experts, Jim Chodash, who, who Don Stone knows well from Oklahoma, told us, oh, it's never going to work because you're using too little steroids. And then the person right behind him in line came up to me and said, you all, if you're using steroids or bacterial ulcers, you all better have a good lawyer. So we saw both sides. So I think it was still probably a little bit more, a little bit of controversy when we started. Um, the study, most of the patients were enrolled at the Arab and Eye Care system. It's a system of five or six hospitals, four of the hospitals we used uh, for the study. Proctor Foundation, we enrolled a few, and Dartmouth uh, Medical School with Mike Segans, we enrolled a few. The, uh, for those, I don't know, who have been to Aravind, it's in Madurai, which you can see is sort of the, uh, almost at the tip there of South India, and their hospitals are scattered around in Tamil Nadu in that area. It's an impressive place. Uh, it's um, um, worth, worth a visit. Um, and I should mention that Dr. Srinivasan, the first author here, was the PI for the study. He's an uh, incredible cornea expert at uh, Madurai. Now, to be included in this trial, we basically took all bacterial ulcers. We took nocardia. Perhaps we shouldn't have. You'll see at the end, but we took nocardia. We took ones that were severe ulcers. We took uh, ones that were not severe ulcers. If there was an impending perforation or a desmetacea, we did not take the patient. Now, to be enrolled, you had to be treated with antibiotics for 48 hours first. And remember, this was an era where in India they weren't using steroids at all, so they wanted to be uh, a little bit sure they were willing to use it after 48 hours. Um, the other reason to wait 48 hours is we wanted to be sure they were bacterial ulcers, so we only enrolled culture-positive bacterial ulcers. And the study intervention 
was predphosphate versus uh, a placebo. The reason we used predphosphate rather than predacetate, which is used a lot more commonly in the U.S. at least, is predphosphate is, um, can be in solution and be, can be clear. It's easy to mask. Predacetate basically would be really difficult to mask. So the regimen was not that much. It was four times a day for a week, twice a day for a week, and once a day for a week. We actually wanted to do double that, but once again, people were not comfortable at the time with uh, giving steroids to these ulcers. The primary outcome was best spectral corrected visual acuity uh, at three months, and we controlled for baseline acuity. So it was a bad ulcer coming in. Uh, that was recognized. It was a good ulcer coming in. It was recognized. We did lots of secondary outcomes, which I'm not going to have time to talk to you about today. Um, but they were everything you probably could imagine there. There were 500 patients, 250 randomized to each arm. We had pretty good follow-up. We had close to 90% follow-up, which for a disease that's almost, that is uh, essentially like trauma, people are coming in, they're not your regular patients. For then for almost 90% to come back at three months, we thought was pretty good. The baseline characteristics between the two arms are shown here. If any of you were at my Sunday, I think it was Sunday morning talk, um, I actually think this is about the least important thing in the world for a clinical trial. Uh, but the journals force you to put it in there. Um, but I'll, I'll show it to you. They, it seemed balanced between the two arms. What is important, though, is the organisms that were in the trial. Even though, like I said, we all pretty much get the same organisms, we get va uh, vastly different proportions. And a large proportion were pneumococcus, um, pseudomonas you'd expect, but the second most positive gram-positive there is nocardia, which is pretty rare in the U.S. I don't know how much you see here. Some? Not much. Yeah. That ends up being important. Um, the main research question, the primary outcome, does adding topical steroids to the treatment of bacterial coronary ulcer improve three-month acuity? Remember, these are culture-positive bacterial ulcers. These aren't ulcers that we thought were bacteria. These are ones that were definitely bacteria. Um, the two, uh, on the left, you'll see baseline, and on the right, you'll see three months. What you'll notice is this is a box and whiskers plot, which isn't really worth going through, except that central line in the box is the median, the 50th percentile. And you'll see that they were basically identical at baseline, and at three months, they were basically identical. It, was, it could not have been closer to a tie. The steroid group won by one tenth of a line of acuity. So, this 500 patient study, we do it, and it was this controversial issue, and it turns out not really to matter. Um, so we joined the long list here of studies with no significant difference. We were a little discouraged. We did look more closely at the data. Remember with an RCT, it's the primary outcome that you're obviously most concerned with. So everything past that is, doesn't carry the same weight as, uh, as you know, the RCT primary comparison. But one thing is where there are more adverse events with steroids, because one of the main reasons Americans were not using steroids for bacterial ulcers is we were scared because we'd heard of these cases that had melted where the ulcers had done poorly. Well, it turns out the adverse events were almost identical between the two arms. If you go about three quarters of the way down, you'll notice the uh, increase in info, no, I'm sorry, um, IOP elevated greater than 25. That happened 10 times in the placebo arm, but only twice in the corticosteroid arm. So this worry that you would see a uh, jump in eye pressure didn't seem to be founded. As a matter of fact, it was kind of the other way around. I wouldn't make too much of it, but I certainly would feel comfortable in terms of eye pressure. The other interesting finding is directly above that, no healing of epithelial defect by 21 days. Now, steroids are known in some contexts to inhibit healing of epithelial defects. And in an earlier pilot trial, we would found that the steroids uh, increased the healing time, reduced the healing. And this was confirmed again in this. So even though I wouldn't make too much of these p-values on the right, because we're comparing lots and lots of things, that's really that increase in healing time with steroids has now been consistent in, uh, across a number of studies. And the fact that the eye pressure wasn't elevated in the, in the steroid group was kind of interesting. Well, Scott, question number three. How did the pseudomonas ulcers fare? This was, in America, our biggest worry. Everybody said, sure, go ahead and give it in staph. Go ahead and give it Moraxella. The lore was it was good for Moraxella ulcers. But whatever you do, do not give it to a pseudomonas ulcer. 
It turns out the pseudomonas ulcers in general in this study were about a one and a half lines worse than the other ulcers. So they came in bad. But at three months, they had the same acuity as the other ulcers. So this is what our friends at Aravind had already st always told us. They said, oh, the pseudomonas ulcers aren't that bad. They end up doing pretty well with treatment. What they were wor really worried about were the pneumococcal ulcers there. Uh, but that held up. But the interesting thing is that it was about half a line better with steroids in pseudomonas patients than not with steroids. So not significant, nothing to make a big deal about, but the organism that we were most worried about, pseudomonas, was the one, if, if you're looking at the numbers, you would be least worried about now. Um, but there was an organism that uh, did fare poorly, and that was nocardia. Nocardia was, did significantly worse with steroids than with the placebo. So if you have a nocardia ulcer, do not use steroids. I think that's one of the me messages from the trial. Um, what about those bad ulcers? What about those central ulcers? They come in there, uh, however you want to define it, it turns out we got the same result, whether it was, uh, was the vision less than 2400, was it central, was it uh, the depth estimated to be to the, to the deepest third of the cornea. No matter how we defined a bad ulcer, they all did better with steroids. Um, and for example, the ones with the worst acuity were 1.7 lines better with steroids than with placebo. So what that means is if you have a mild ulcer, it doesn't really matter. If you have a moderate ulcer, eh, it didn't really matter that much. But if you looked at the, say, 15% that were the bad ulcers, they actually did a line or two better with steroids. So that started to get interesting. Remember, this is all secondary data analysis. Um, here's, here's one that you, you can see was treated with steroids and did quite well. Of course, we could find others that uh, were not treated with steroids and did quite well. What about 12 months? Let's take out the nocardia patients now. We did a 12-month follow-up. The primary outcome was at three months, but we kept following everybody for 12 months. Overall, no nocardias, but you know, good ulcers, bad ulcers, one line better with steroids. And if you divided that group into the good ulcers and bad ulcers, the bad ulcers did three lines better with steroids at 12 months. So we're starting to see a pattern here. What about early administration of steroids? Now remember, we were kind of handcuffed here for two reasons. One is our, uh, our committee that decided uh, what we would do for the study didn't want to give steroids in the first 48 hours. So we already had a two-day delay at, the, at a minimum. But also, people often come in taking some antibiotics. In South India, you can just get them even without a prescription. So uh, it was probably half the patients or so at that time, maybe two-thirds, came in taking antibiotics. So they'd already been taking antibiotics for a number of days. This was all recorded. You can see on the x-axis is the number of days antibiotics prior to uh, the steroids. So it would be at least two days, but it might be more. And then the number of patients on the y-axis. We could divide this just arbitrarily into those who we gave steroids fairly early and those who we gave air steroids fairly late. Now, if you look just in the ones who got the steroids early, they did a line better, and it was significant. So, uh, and they did a lot, the severe ones did a lot better. So it's almost, all of those, those of us who were very worried said, don't use it in pseudomonas, don't use it in central ulcers, don't use it early, wait until we, you've really got the organism under control. We were dead wrong on all three of those things. So um, the major messages for Scott, the, our bacterial ulcer study, before I get into fungal ulcers, is that there's no difference overall. That means if you're not a fan of steroids, you can just cite this study and say, oh, that's why I don't use it. If you're a fan of steroids, you can cite the study and say that's why you use it. Um, there was no increase in adverse events, so I don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, there was no problem with pseudomonas. As a matter of fact, of the organisms, pseudomonas did the best. And uh, steroids were better in the worst ulcers. Interestingly, if you looked by 12 months, the steroid treated group did better, and they were better if given early. So it's tempting, were these trials easy to do, to start a uh, trial with a stronger steroid, perhaps Durazol, something like that, and to start at day one rather than wait 48 hours. But those are the results of Scott. So should you use steroids? It's still up to you. But, you know, if you see a large central pseudomonas ulcer and you catch them fairly early, uh, I think that's probably where the odds are in your favor for using topical steroids.
And I should, I should not let this pass without mentioning the real dangers of steroids, which are that you think it's a bacterial infection and it's not a bacterial infection, and you're not actually, actually covering the agent. And we all know you can get in trouble with that with, uh, with herpes infections, with acanthamoeba. Um, in the U.S., basically, being on steroids of presentation is your risk factor for a bad outcome in acanthamoeba. And in uh, fungal ulcers, which I'm going to talk about next, interestingly, um, our colleagues in India were, this was uh, uh, unfortunately a case of fusarium that was treated with steroids for a while before it was realized it was fungal. Um, our, colli our colleagues in India said, um, you know, that's great, thanks for helping us with this bacterial study, um, but we kind of have those under control. What we're really worried about is these fungal ulcers. Uh, at Aravind, they get, um, probably it's about half fungal and half bacterial, but because people can use over-the-counter over antibiotics and frequently do, uh, when the, by the time they're seen at Aravind, um, there, it's about two-thirds fungal and about one-third bacterial for the infections. So what about fungal ulcers? They also do worse, uh, if you look at the same institution, they'll have uh, worse acuity than the bacterial ulcers after at three months, and they're more expensive to treat. So fungal ulcers really are uh, tougher. We all knew that, but if you, if you add up the numbers, they really are. Um, in the U.S., they were not a big concern if you lived outside of maybe F Florida and parts of Texas. Uh, until um, about 19, uh, 2006. It was a worldwide epidemic. I don't know how much was seen here. Singapore was the first to notice it. As we all know, it had to do with the um, antimicrobial properties of some of the contact lens uh, solutions. And there was a spike in the U.S. And the American doctors did not know what to do. We did not know how to treat these. Um, and it sort of the epidemic came and went, and uh, it was, but it left a lot of questions. How can we do better? Were this ever to come again, or were we to live in a part of the world like South India where these are everyday occurrences? How can we treat these better? The obvious questions were, well, how about uh, anti changing antimicrobials? And voriconazole was relatively recent uh, as an oral drug. It's kind of the oral wonder drug because amphotericin is so bad in IV and oral voriconazole has manageable side effects and you can take orally and you, you can use the IV preparation as an eye drop in exactly the same 1% concentration. So it really couldn't be easier. Um, there are interstromal injections. There's oral voriconazole. There's collagen cross-linking. Again, Don is uh, interested in this with uh, antimicrobial. Um, and then there's early DALC. Um, I'm going to concentrate on voriconazole now. Um, and r just to remind you of those levels of evidence, let's start again at expert opinion. We did a poll of uh, ophthalmologists in the Cornea Society, and we said if you, if uh, we gave them a case and we said, oh, a patient comes in with a fungal ulcer, what would your, we asked a number of questions, but what would your most preferred antifungal be in an ideal world? In other words, you don't have to worry about cost and availability. And 79% said voriconazole. And one person wrote in that their first choice was voriconazole, their second choice was voriconazole, and their third choice was voriconazole. So expert opinion clearly favored voriconazole. You can't see this, I don't think, in the picture, but that faintly says voriconazole. That's Pfizer's drug. There was some lab evidence to back this up. Aspergillus, the old azoles, were pretty good at killing. These are um, minimum inhib inhibitory concentrations. So the lower con the concentration, the uh, more the drug inhibited it, the better. The high concentrations, the high numbers are bad. And um, you can see, if you look over at itraconazole and cross that with aspergillus, you get 0.125, which is really, really low. So itraconazole, which is an old drug, kills fusarium pretty well. But you look at, I mean, it kills aspergillus pretty well, but if you look at itraconazole and fusarium, it didn't kill the fusarium at the highest concentration tested. So that's really always been the weak spot with the azoles is the fusarium cases, not the aspergillus cases. But the new generation of azoles that came along, voriconazole is the famous one, posiconazole is a cousin drug made by another company, which is essentially the same, uh, did fairly well with the fusarium. Those numbers two and four 
are not bad. Those are about what amphotericin and natamycin are. Remember that the concentration of these drugs are given, that we give are completely different. Amphotericin, we give about 0.15%, but some, you can give from 0.1 to 0.5. Natamycin, you give it 5%. And uh, voriconazole, we're giving at 1%. But when you take all that into account, voriconazole was in the league as, uh, of, the natomyce, of the polyenes, amphotericin and natamycin. Now, the weakness with natamycin, it, weak with, the weakness with amphotericin, one of them is, is you have to make it up, and it's kind of toxic. With natamycin, it's not toxic. You can give it at 5%, but it does not, like amphotericin, it does not penetrate an intact epithelium. So that's a disadvantage because as your ulcer's healing, do you really want to be scraping the epithelium just to make sure the drug's getting in? Uh, the azoles penetrate an intact epithelium. So here we had a drug that looks pretty good in the lab, um, was easily available, and uh, penetrated the epithelium better than the old polyenes. And the doctors seemed to love it. You know, 79% uh, said it was their first choice. There were a few case series. I think it'd be too much to say that there was a prospective cohort study, although there were some studies that were, once people realized that the fusarium epidemic was happening, there were, they did start collecting data prospectively. We did a pilot study, but it wasn't really large enough to show a difference. And then we went ahead to do an RCT, which was pretty courageous given the history, our history and other people's history here with RCTs. And the NEI generously funded it. I, we did not put this table in our grant application. Um, the new study was called the Mycotic Ulcer Treatment Trial, or MUT, and it was comparing topical natamycin versus, top, versus topical voriconazole. And it was only in filamentous fungal keratitis. Do you guys get um, candida here or no? Yeah, you get some. Interestingly, at Aravind, they get almost zero. We had Dr. Prajna visiting us at, at San Francisco, and he, had, he told us a few years ago he had never seen a candida case before. Here he's in the heart, heartland in South India of um, fungal ulcers, but he hadn't since then he has. Um, but th we limited this to filamentous fungal keratitis. Another reason we did is candida is not as, keratitis is not as difficult to treat. As uh, one of Don's mentors, Jack Witcher, said, uh, Canada's a pussycat. So, um, but the, the MUT study, it was actually two studies. There's MUT1, which compared topical natamycin to topical voriconazole, and then there's MUT2, which compared oral, the addition of oral voriconazole or oral placebo. That study, we've just, in finished, just finished enrollment. We're waiting for the final three-month visits, but that study is almost done. The um, results of this study were interesting to us. Remember, all the doctors thought voriconazole was going to be best. Natamycin did two lines better. Um, and in fusarium cases, it was four lines better. Four lines, that is a lot. That is a huge difference. Um, so first of all, we now have a successful trial, finally. Um, but second of all, this is actually bad news, even though it was the first time we had shown a difference between antimicrobial agents with the corneal ulcer trial, because the new wonder drug didn't work, and the old standard that had been available for 50 years was still the best. So it turns out not to have affected our fungal corneal ulcer treatment in the way that we would have liked. Um, just as a follow-up, another group um, from Melvi Prasad, Sharma, in 2015, uh, found with only 118 patients pretty much the same thing, that overall it was a little better, in the fusarium cases it was a lot better. So uh, that means that, uh, for, for one, do not use voriconazole monotherapy, particularly for fusarium keratitis. Interestingly, if you only looked at the non-fusarium cases, let's, for example, let's say if you only looked at the aspergillus cases, there was not a clinical difference between the two groups. The acuities were about the same at three months. But if you looked at the, we, we also had a reculture at day six. If you looked at the micro, microbiological outcome, in other words, how many of the ulcers were cleared with natamycin versus how many were cleared with voriconazole, even in the aspergillus cases, natamycin did a lot better than the voriconazole. So um, this is another lesson which I only learned too late, and that is if you talk with your infectious disease colleagues, They'll say if you do a randomized controlled trial of an infectious disease, do not use a clinical outcome. It's, it's difficult to show that antibiotics cure pneumonia with a clinical outcome. 
it's easy to show with a microbiological outcome. And once again, we found with corneal ulcer trials that the microbiological outcome is much more sensitive than a clinical outcome. So if you're thinking of doing any trials, you may want to put that in. Um, but this also brings us back to the levels of, e levels of evidence, because not only do we get to stage to level two evidence with our RCT, Sharma quickly followed it up, so we are now officially level one evidence, um, which puts the burden back on all the doctors again to think of some new um, treatments. Because we talked a little bit about this, I think, on Sunday morning, but these levels of evidence, they always have the experts at the bottom and then uh, all these studies, you know, at higher, higher level, level of evidence. Um, but that's deceptive for a few reasons. 99% of what we know is level five or level four, and it is good stuff. This is where most of our good treatments come from. Um, there are cases where we have the resources we, where we can actually compare to treatments in a randomized controlled trial, but that's a minority of the medical decisions we get. So I, don't, I wouldn't think of this as a hierarchy. I think in the future I may reverse it and put expert opinion on the top, because um, after this trial, it really comes back to expert opinion. Vorconazole didn't work. What are we going to do? And it may require a trial to prove it. Um, there is a small, there's small trials going on with intrastromal injections of vorconazole. The oral vorconazole study, like I mentioned, will become available soon. There are reasons to think that oral voriconazole may work when topical voriconazole didn't work very well. Even though topical voriconazole penetrates well, it's a uh, thought to be a um, not a concentration-dependent killer, but a time-dependent killer. So some drugs, if you get it at a very high concentration, it'll kill the drug quickly. Other drugs need the organism needs to be in the presence of the antimicrobial for a long period of time. Vorconazole is the latter. So you can think with an eye drop, you get a really high concentration, but it dissipates pretty quickly. And yes, you can try to give it every half hour or hour for a while, but you're not going to be able to do that for too long. Whereas an oral drug, you can reach a steady state concentration in the anterior chamber and in the deep cornea. So it may be that oral, oral vorconazole works where topical really didn't do much. We'll see. I have not seen those results because as with all the trials, the uh, investigators are the last one to see what happens. Um, collagen cross-linking is promising. Again, Don's interested in that. Early DALK, uh, there's a large group in China that is promoting this. Um, they've, they've had, at UCSF, they will not do this. And at uh, Aravin, they've tried some cases and they've not been particularly successful. I don't know how you've been here with uh, fungal ulcers and early DALK. Um, so if, you, if you're faced, this is a fusarium ulcer, if you're faced with a fusarium ulcer, I don't have positive news to tell you. Uh, there are some people who still think that, oh, if I add voriconazole to natamycin, maybe I'll get some synergy. We're not seeing that synergy in vitro. So in the lab, you don't uh, consistently see synergy between an azole and natamycin, so I'm not sure I'd really recommend it. I think given the choice, I would probably just give more natamycin than mixing it with voriconazole. Um, but I would tell you, do not use topical voriconazole alone, uh, and make sure you get some natamycin in there. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the people who did both of these studies. Dr. Srinivasan was the PI for the Scott study, and Dr. Prajna, both of these are at Aravind and Madurai. Uh, for the fungal ulcer mud study. Uh, Nisha Acharya, who um, not only is a, gr a great trialist and doing the FAST trial here with you all at um, KCASH, uh, she was also Don's co-fellow um, co in Dartmouth, and the Data Safety and Monitoring Committee. Um, I've been interested in global ophthalmology for a long time, international ophthalmology, and both Ivan Schwab and Tony Aldave at one of the meetings said to me, Tom, you've, how can you say you're interested in international ophthalmology? You've never been to KCASH. So uh, when I go back, I will tell them I have. And uh, thank you very much for letting me talk. I enjoyed your presentation. I would like to, uh, I'm sure you know, very well know, that the person who had the most influence at the Proctor not to use steroids for several decades was Phil Tigerson. And he used to tell me that he never saw a case 
of herpes that perforated before 1951. And when steroids became available, he was seeing many cases of perforations of herpes because of the use and the wide use of steroids. Because steroids, when they were introduced in the early 50s, were used for everything, and including infections. So he came with the dogma that steroids should not be used, and later on reinforced it by the immunologic facts and how it can interfere with the protein synthesis and the immune uh, system as well. And we listened to him, and we never challenged him. And if we did, he became red in the face and very upset. And Chan Dawson used to, you know, come and say, you know, I'll use steroids in some cases of herpetic stromal keratitis. And uh, Dr. Tigerson used to be very upset. So uh, we lived in an era where no steroids were an infectious disease. But as you have done, I, you know, this is a scientific approach to tell us whether we can use steroids. If not, when we don't use them, and if yes, what are the situation where we are allowed to use topical steroids? But I think we should respect what Phil Tigerson taught us, that we should not use steroids in infectious diseases unless we have a clear objectives what we are doing. The other thing is that in this part of the world, steroids can be taken over the counter. And if you prescribe them, sometimes they like them so much that they will keep on using them and abusing them. So one has to be very careful. What I do in my practice is I prepare my own steroids and give them a bottle which is not labeled, except with the eye drops and the instructions how to use it. And this is especially for those people who tend to abuse the drugs, I don't write a prescription sometimes because of this. So uh, I do appreciate what you mentioned. I uh, also was very much interested in nocardia. I want to tell you that we see many cases of nocardia here. And I don't know why. And they are frequently missed because most of the antibiotics that are available are not effective right. against nocardia. And nocardia is related to the mycobacteria. It's a cousin right. of the mycobacteria. So mycobacteria, chelonia, and others, you can see them in some of these cases, and it's hard to, to treat. So I see a number of them, maybe uh, because they are referred from other physicians, but that nocardia is frequently missed, especially because you don't see a hypopian most of the time with it and they are misdiagnosed as herpes, and you end up in a chronic, some patients may stay for six to seven months with a nocardia ulcer. So uh, coming to fung fungi, we did a study here, and we found out that in this part of the, in the central province, Riyadh area, the most common fungal keratitis is aspergillus. And we have to keep in mind that the spores of aspergillus can withstand a temperature of above 80, and sometimes a very high temperature. And spores here, you can recover them from the soil around us. And in summer, the temperature may reach 55, 52 sometimes, and the spores are still viable. While we don't see fusarium, in Jeddah, which is the west coast of Saudi Arabia, uh, Arabia is uh, larger than Europe. The west coast, we see the most common fungal keratitis is fusarium. And uh, this is uh, a little bit different and maybe similar because of the humidity and other factors. Maybe. Now, candida, we see it, but we don't see it very often. We see it in uh, patients who are immunosuppressed. Right. I see. I saw a couple of cases with who had hyperalimentation, had candidemia, uh, 
and had retinitis, candida retinitis. Corneal ulcers due to candida is not common here. And uh, maybe, I'm, I'm not sure because uh, maybe the, the spores are different or the, the candida is different from the, but aspergillus, because of the structure of the spore, it can survive very abductious environmental conditions and therefore we recover it. We can recover it from bread after the loaf goes inside the oven and comes back. Still viable. And still viable. <laughs> So uh, it's frightening. if you leave any piece of bread here on the shelf for five days, you will find Aspergillus niger yeah. on it. So it is, it's a common uh, uh, organism. So uh, for the etiology of fungi in Saudi Arabia, it differs where you are in Saudi Arabia, and you can see different types of uh, fungi. Finally, I want to make a comment is that... Uh, the expert opinion that you have put very nicely uh, the, uh, in, in number five can be more important than number one, mm -hmm. especially if you have a, an adverse anecdote. Uh, sometimes you see one complication that you will change your whole practice, and you don't need to have randomized controlled trials. And so we have to keep in mind that although these are levels, but they can be used in clinical situations depending on the circumstances that we go through. And we should not say, oh, this is level one, it's better than five or better than four, because five can be more important than the tightest confidence interval that we have, and we should not disregard these observations and expertise and experience like you. You know, another reason that uh, expert opinion is the most important one is that's who's treating the patients. So uh, we are starting to do, and other groups are starting, when you do a trial, you do a survey of experts before the trial, you do the trial, and then you see, did your trial even mean anything to people? Did you change expert opinion at all? But Don, could I tie together a couple of his points? Is that um, the nocardia here did not do well, probably because all the patients were treated with moxifloxacin. Now, you, the physician was allowed to change the medication ethically if they thought they had to, but they frequently would wait a few days because they were already started with moxifloxacin. Um, the fluoroquinolones in vitro do pretty well with nocardia. Susceptibility testing, it looks pretty good. In practice, it is not good. Those patients need to be treated with amikacin. So I think uh, this gets back to Tigesin. Tigesin was correct that uh, you do not use steroids unless you know what the agent is and unless the agent is taken care of. And nocardia, I do not think we were taking care of the organism while we were giving the steroids. I think that's why I did poorly. Um, it's also interesting that you bring up Tigesin because those who uh, have never heard of Proctor or don't know us very well, Tigesin was our founder. Um, Proctor was founded to eradicate trachoma, and uh, Tigesin was interested in that at the time. It, it expanded to other infectious diseases and uveitis. But he was really, he carried an enormous amount of influence on the west coast of the U.S. for 50 years in ophthalmology and on the east coast. So the fact that he was against steroids, the lore is that a couple doctors were fired from Proctor because they used steroids. I don't know if it's true, but that's the lore. And just as you were saying this, Dr. Tabarro, I realized we submitted the first proposal for this grant to the NIH the year that we lost Tigesin. So maybe he was sort of standing over us. And uh, once, once he was not there, we felt comfortable going ahead. But he was a legend and a great man. He actually, I should put in one more plug for him, he discovered two diseases, not only the one which you may hear about, the SPK, but also SL, I mean, uh, yeah, SLK. Yeah, exactly. He was the first to notice that as well. Any other questions? With, with, with uh, Theodore was also exactly. described the SLK with him. Exactly. So it'd be curious to hear from some of the uh, interior segment faculty here the thoughts on the, the, the relative prevalence of aspergillus here versus fusarium. 
um, because I think the standard here is often to use voriconazole as first-line therapy for fungal keratitis. And, and I think because it's perhaps more aspergillus is the most common organism, I'm curious to hear what some other faculty think about that and how this maybe influences our practice. Dr. Summer? Thank you. Um, so um, as what Professor Tobara mentioned before, the, uh, the aspergillus uh, tend to be the, the commonest uh, organism here. And there were um, a second study done by uh, one of our uh, former colleagues, uh, Dr. Justinia. So she reported the, the fungal outcome here in Kekash over the last 20 years. And again, it confirmed uh, the first study done by uh, Professor Tabara, that it's uh, aspergillus. The uh, only thing is that because of the uh, trend of the uh, foriconazole use in the literature, uh, over the last four years, most of the surgeons here, they, they deviated to uh, the use of uh, foriconazole. Uh, as amphotericin was our first line of choice together uh, versus uh, natamycin, depends whether it's hypo or um, uh, So because of the toxicities and everything, people wanted to use it. But again, uh, most of us, we noticed that there is no response with fusarium. Uh, and we are trying to avoid it. Whenever we get the uh, culture, uh, identifying in fusarium, most of us were shifting back uh, to nanomycin. We're trying to avoid it uh, recently. Uh, the, the second thing is that we are still using foriconazole systemically uh, for, for our patients uh, as the side effects are, are much more uh, less in comparison to, to etroconazole or other, uh, right. other medications. So that's the deviation. One more thing I want to mention is that with the um, um, a new era of D6 in you know, uh, over the past few years, uh, we tended to get uh, some fungal keratitis associated with DSEC. I had a discussion with um, Mark Terry and others, uh, you know, in the state, Baskin Balmers and everything, and they shared the same experience. Uh, in fact, most of the candidates that were cultured over the past, like, uh, 10, 15 years, in addition to what Professor Tabara was mentioning, were just uh, related to some of our, the, uh, our RIM, uh, culture positive. So we had uh, published some uh, small series in journal Cornea, culture positive RIM from uh, BKBs that turned to develop a fungal keratitis and they were related to candida. And uh, recently we're getting similar thing uh, in two or three of our DSEX. So uh, one should be aware that if you have any uh, infiltrate uh, related uh, to a fresh DSEC or to, to keep it in mind. Um, I know I noticed that this is like just a general microbial keratitis. It's not uh, following PKB or DSEC. Right. But uh, for us, uh, this is now number one uh, organism to look into if we have any infection uh, after DSEC. Do you That's use oral azoles? Sorry, Dinra. Uh, do you use okay. oral azoles here um, for fungal keratitis? Uh, the, As the to supplement. The, um, the only medication that we're using here is, um, as I told you, the, the foriconazole systemically, if you're yeah. talking about the azoles. Uh, otherwise, uh, we use our, um, our regular topical medication, uh, not other. And sometimes, at like 10 years ago, we used to give some subconch injection of etraconazole. Right. Etraconazole, subconch. That's it. That's the only deviation. But we're following the same thing. Amphotericin, natamycin, foriconazole, sometimes subinjection uh, with itra, but no other thing. Now, if it's aspergillus, yeah. I suspect itraconazole will do just as well as voriconazole. Exactly. And I think the azoles will do really well. Yeah. If it's candida, I think probably any of them will work. Okay. The only thing is that we noticed recently that we are getting some resistant strains of morexella. Of what? Morexella. Uh, morexella, yes. I, uh, can you comment on the Morixella? I've seen quite a good number of Morixella here. There are about 15 in the SCUT trial. It's more common proportion, well, you're talking about Morixella. Yes. It's more common proportionally in San Francisco than it is in India, but of course they get so many more. Uh, there were about 15 in the SCUT trial. They did not, Morixella was the one bacteria that even the old textbook said you should treat with steroids. So, because, um, you'd get that haze in the corner, you put a drop of steroids, it completely disappear, and the ulcer would, st Moraxella ulcer would still do quite well. We could not see that effect from these 15 patients. Moraxella looked like just, just like the other organisms in Scott. Now, if you're talking about the resistance, yes. um, I don't, I'm not sure any of these were resistant to fluoroquinolone with Moraxella. Um, what's your second line? What else do you use with Moraxella when you? 
actually we started to shift toward the amikacin to yeah. promycins. Yeah. Also power patients. And they do just fine then, yeah. right? Yeah, and combination therapy, actually. I add with the, the fluoroquinolones yeah. recently, yeah. That's what I'm trying to do, to, to do combination therapy. Yeah. Yeah. They don't respond well to the cephal cephalosporins in general, yeah. One more thing is that, uh, uh, what about uh, methicillin resistant stuff, or yes, methicillin resistant stuff, AV? Do you come across yeah, uh, we do. in India? In, in India, they do not. Not a single one of these cases. There are a fair number of staff cases, and that none were um, MRSA. Um, in the U.S., we do, as you know, um, and we worry about it ten times more than we see it. As a matter of fact, at UCSF proper, not the Depart not Proctor Foundation, they start patients off um, when they re when they think it's a bacterial ulcer uh, with vancomycin and a gram-negative agent. And then if it turns out to be a gram positive, and particularly if it turns out to be staph aureus, they continue the vancomycin. Now, that does sound nice because that'll get the MRSA, but a minority of, the of staph is still MRSA in these cases. It's not a majority. The MRSA doesn't do worse clinically than the MSSA at the Proctor Foundation. I don't know elsewhere. Okay. Um, and the last thing is if you're a sensitive, if you're susceptible to beta lactams and other things, um, beta lactams kill organisms a lot quicker than vancomycin does, and vancomycin is very toxic. So I do not think it should be a first line agent. Staph aureus tends to be on the slow side anyway. I think, yes, if it turns out to be MRSA, go ahead and add vancomycin, but I wouldn't start with it. But we, cannot even, we can't convince half our faculty of that mm -hmm. wisdom. So. I see. Okay. Um, what about using azithromycin? For, for MRSA? Yes. Topically or yeah, orally? Topically, yeah. Yeah. Um, we actually haven't used it. That sounds reasonable. It's not a particularly quick killer either, yeah. so we don't really use it that much with ulcers, but um, azithromycin is my favorite drug, so you're teasing yeah. me up here. We're using it only for atypic and mycobacterium. Yeah. Most of our cases. Yeah. But for, for, for strep nemo and MRSAs and ever, we don't have a lot of experience with that. Yeah. You know, wanna, do we have time for one other thought, or are we running one more? Um, we've sort of alluded to this with a couple of these comments about using two agents rather than just one. It's always tempting to add more agents. You know, we see a bad acanthamoeba case, we all add three or four agents. Really, in medicine, the infectious disease people are a little ahead of us here, but there are really only a few reasons for using two agents. One is synergy, and synergy is a pretty rare thing. Most, you know, we can think of a few examples we learned in med school, and that's about it. It's really hard to show synergy. Other reasons are to broaden the coverage. You think it's bacteria, but you don't know if it's gram-negative or gram-positive. To reduce the side effects. We used to use triple sulfa because it would uh, crystallize and hurt the, kin the kidneys. If you use just one sulfa, but if you use three, they wouldn't crystallize very much. Or, for example, in oncology, they'll use multiple multiple drugs to um, up to the toxicity limit. Um, and then the last reason is uh, to prevent uh, de novo drug resistance like we do with TB and uh, with HIV. But if you think about it, maybe the broad spectrum would be a good reason to occasionally use two. But synergy is not a great reason in ophthalmology. So usually at Proctor, we end up trying to find one drug and just give more of that drug rather than having the patient switch and give two drugs. Thank you. And just to remind everyone, we are having an additional bonus lecture from Dr. Leitman here in a little while. So I think maybe I can't remember what Dr. Sammy told me if he's here. Anyway, I'll make up, make up a plan then since he isn't here. So maybe a 15- or 20-minute break to grab some tea and then come back in. And if you have time, please join us for a, another lecture from Dr. Liebman on trachoma. Thanks. <laughs>
need your mic. I can't see the Okay, should I, uh, should I start so we can get out of here? The next uh, talk is going to be uh, another one of my favorite topics. Uh, it's on trachoma. I want to thank Don Stone again for inviting me. It's good to see him. Don was one of our legendary fellows. Perhaps the best year of the Proctor Fellowship ever with... Uh, Maybe second best after your year. My year? You all, true, because my year was with David Greitz, who you will uh, soon meet, who is coming soon. But no, your year was better. Um, now... I don't have any personal disclosures. This is really just who paid for our studies. Um, but everybody's made it clear to me that you actually don't see much trachoma here anymore, if any at all, maybe a little scarring in the elderly. Um, I know that that's actually not the reason I'm giving this talk. It's not for clinical care of trachoma. It's because I think we're at kind of a neat point with trachoma control. Um, there, there are two diseases that, infectious diseases that we've been able to eradicate. Do people know what those two are? I know you know one of them. Smallpox. Smallpox. Excellent. The second one's kind of a trick question, so I'd be surprised. There was one audience once who knew. I don't even know how they knew. It's a rinderpest, which is a measles-like virus in cattle in Europe. So there's only been one human infectious disease we've ever eradicated. Trachoma, actually, we may be able to eradicate, and that's sort of what I want to talk about here. So even this, though this won't be of great interest in the care of your patients, um, although you will see some, even in the U.S., we see some old trachoma cases, um, I think it's interesting culturally and as a doctor and in public health that one of these diseases that could soon be eradicated, which basically has never been done before, a bacterial disease eradicated, is an eye disease. So I'm going to talk a little about the history, a little about the epidemiology, and then ask you a question in the end. Uh, trachoma is um, an obligate intracellular parasite. It can only replicate in other cells. It doesn't make its own uh, ATP. Chlamydia does not make its own ATP. And cl the chlamydia trachomatis strains that cause trachoma are specially um, evolved to replicate in human epithelial cells, particularly human conjunctival cells. So here's a human epithelial cell right here. Here's the nucleus. Here's some polys surrounding it. And all these little dots are chlamydia inclusions. It looks like a virus. People thought it was a virus for decades before they realized it was a deficient bacteria. It's distantly related to gram-negative bacteria. Um, and it, the reason it's important that it's a bacteria rather than a virus is, of course, that you treat it with antibiotics. Here's a kid in Ethiopia, and the first thing you'll know if any of you, if, notice if any of you have been to Ethiopia, are these face flies. They're muscasorbans, or sucking fly. They're cousins of musca domestica, or normal house fly. Uh, muscasorbans is all over the place in Ethiopia. We don't have it in the U.S. I'm not sure if it's in the, the um, different parts of the Middle East. The lore is that this transmits trachoma, and you can kind of see why. This is a moisture-seeking fly, very dry areas. It's collecting the moisture in the corners of the eye and along the nose. All the kids have them. It's kind of fun to watch because a kid will come into the exam station with a bunch of flies hovering over them, and the kid will leave, and I think those same flies go home with them. It's amazing that they've just co-evolved with us, and they're all over the place. Um, the Classic signs of trachoma, this is actually my eye, this is not a diseased eye, but it's a reminder for the people who aren't uh, cornea, external disease, that if you flip the eyelid, all these are normal blood vessels, but if you flipped over the eyelid of that little kid, it might look like this. Uh, you can't see any of those normal blood vessels, and uh, you see these buried follicles, and they're, they're buried in a pattern that you really don't see with other diseases. The only other disease that we get confused with turns out to be the um, uh, contact lens related. 
disease, which uh, fortunately contact lenses are not uh, used in the same area as they get trachoma typically. The other thing you'll notice is these flies. They have a characteristic uh, thorax, which is different than Musca domestica. And um, they're called sucking flies because they really suck up this uh, moisture. Evidently, they use the protein and, and calories. Um, and then they regurgitate, suck up again, regurgitate, and that's part of their digestion, I think. Um, but they're all over the place. This child, this infection will not cause this child to go blind. As a matter of fact, even without antibiotics, on average, the kid will probably clear the infection in about six months. But if they live in a community that has a lot of trachoma, they're going to get reinfected and uh, start to get some scarring. You can see some here. And reinfected again and get more scarring. And eventually, as teenagers or uh, more likely in their 20s or 30s, they'll get an entropion and a trachiasis. And then, of course, they're a setup for what we were talking about earlier, a bacterial or fungal ulcer. So uh, the lashes against the cornea actually aren't causing the blindness. It's really just a setup. I think these, most of the blindness is secondary uh, bacterial or fungal keratitis. We think of trachoma as two diseases, the infection in children and then the scarring and blindness in adults. And this is an age prevalence curve, age on the x-axis, and the prevalence of chlamydial infection in children. This is a village in Egypt between Alexandria and Cairo. Um, but the age prevalence curve could be seen anywhere in, in any of our Ethiopian villages, for example. A peak of infection in three to five-year-olds, half the three to five-year-olds are infected in this community. And then it goes down progressively, progressively where a small percentage of the adults are infected. This is probably, this decrease is probably for a couple reasons. One is you can get partial immunity to chlamydia. So you can get reinfected with the same strain, but you're a little bit less likely to. And the second thing is adults just have better hygiene and interact less. So all diseases we usually see transmitted a little bit less with adults than kids. Now, if you look at that same age prevalence graph but now have scarring on the y-axis, it's the opposite. It progresses over time. And in some of these communities, this is the Egyptian community, in some of our Ethiopian communities, the scarring goes to 100% in the, everybody over sort of 40 years old. And the trachiasis would follow that had I drawn it in, but it might look something like this. And blindness, corneal opacity, follows uh, trachiasis fairly quickly in this setting in the elderly, maybe two or three years on average behind the trichiasis. And it's usually a bilateral disease. If you have scarring on one side, you usually have it on the other. If you have infection on one side, you usually have it on the other. And unfortunately, if you have trichiasis and, and corneal scars, it's usually bilateral. Once you get the trichiasis, if you can get them in that window before they have their corneal opacity, you can do a bilamellar tarsal rotation or any uh, one of the procedures of your choice. And they're fairly effective for about a year. Uh, but if you go back and look five years later, the recurrence is fairly high. So I don't think the answer to this is going to be um, um, surgical. I think it's going to be preventative. Trachoma is a, is a very historical disease. This is a picture of uh, there, there are three medical papyruses that still exist from about 1500 BC, Egyptian papyruses. Uh, they're basically lists of uh, ailments and then the prescription used to treat them. And in these, if you look at these three papyruses, uh, about 15% of the prescriptions are for the eye and are for preventing new eyelash growth. So we think these were actually for trachoma. And Egypt, in, in the old days, used to be a hotbed of trachoma. The, that papyrus was actually the Berkeley papyrus, the Hearst papyrus. The other two are the Smith and the Ebers papyri. Um, but Berkeley has a, UC Berkeley has a large collection. And we asked to go see this Smith medical papyrus, and they showed it to us. And then they said, but while you're here, we wanted to show you this. Um, they were convinced this was ta, which I don't speak Greek, but evidently as a um, pronoun, and then, or an article, and then trachos blepharon, so rough lid. So here, just on one of their random Greek documents, they had uh, some trachoma. It didn't say much else interesting, or I would tell you. Um, does anybody know what this is? This is Ellis Island. So between 1880 and about 1910, in that era, 
a huge number of the European immigrants came through Ellis Island, and every single one had their eyelids flipped for trachoma. As a matter of fact, trachoma was the number one medical reason to be deported back to Europe uh, during this period, 1880, 1910. Three times as many people were deported back, were sent back to Europe for trachoma as for tuberculosis, which was the next most common reason. If you had um, follicles, they would either send you back, or if you were wealthy, they would quarantine you for a few weeks to see if they went away. This was known amongst the Europeans who were, who were uh, trying to immigrate. So they had procedures. They had all these instruments, these expression forceps they'd use. They'd run them up uh, over the lid so that you would turn these follicles, which were really almost necrotic already, into scars. Because if you looked like this, you were allowed into the U.S. If you looked like this, you were not allowed into so kind of a crazy part of our history, particularly because this is not an epidemic disease. It's an endemic disease. You don't go blind from, a, from a, um, uh, an occasional infection. So it's really a tragedy that people were sent back, but it's part of our history. Uh, this is a map. This is a WHO map. Don, we were talking about where trachoma was and where some other diseases were. This is from, I think, 1948. It's a WHO map. The black are the more severe areas. Um, and then they actually, it's hard to tell, but they have a few shades of gray here. There was a trachoma belt in the U.S. Um, I don't know if this is accurate in uh, parts of the Middle East. I suspect it's probably not. Uh, but basically, anywhere people lived almost in the world had trachoma in 1948, although the severity was vastly different. Now let's go ahead about 50 years. This is the 1996 map. You'll notice no more in the U.S. Our last case in the U.S., our last documented case was the late 70s in a Native American reservation in um, uh, New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, so it was about 1978. We have not seen an endogenous case of active trachoma since then. And Europe, it was uh, quite common in South Italy and uh, areas of Spain, no more cases. Um, we don't really know about these areas of the Middle East. I suspect this is uh, exaggerated and a more recent map would have less. China, most of it is old trachoma. Uh, it's really sub-Saharan Africa. And most of the trachoma in the world, most of the blinding trachoma is in Ethiopia. By some measures, I've heard people say that half the blinding trachoma in the world is now in Ethiopia. I showed you the lists, the ranking lists earlier when we were talking about corneal ulcers. 1995, they thought uh, trachoma was number two. By 2002, they had it down to number seven or eight, seven here. Um, I suspect that didn't disappear in seven years. I suspect that was just an appreciation that there was a lot less trachoma than they thought there was. And it's 2010, it's about the same on the ranking, but when they do their next list for in the 2020s, I suspect trachoma will be off the list. There are a few things that we all learn about trachoma. One is that uh, it's transmitted by flies. If you, you can find chlamydia on the fly if you try to PCR it. Um, there, are, there is trachoma in some areas, like Mexico. They don't have muscosorbins, and they still get trachoma. And there are other ways of transmitting trachoma. I suspect a lot of it is just hand to eye, much like pink eye would be in this area or in the US. But these flies really are impressive. And part of the lore with the flies is if you have a dirty face, that attracts the flies. And uh, you know that's just uh, going to spread the trachoma more. And if only you washed everybody's face, wouldn't the trachoma go away? Well, there's no question that kids with a dirty face are more likely to have trachoma than kids with a clean face. But the kids with the dirty face are also a lot more likely to have a lot of other diseases. And we're not really pinning it to washing your face. Um, so you really need to do an RCT. You really need to do a trial where you wash the face of some communities and you don't wash the face of others. That has been tried, and uh, despite what you might have heard, that did not show a difference between the two groups. So no one has ever been able to show that washing a face can cause trachoma to go away in a community. I wish it were that simple. And also, remember a lot of these communities, like uh, some of the communities in Ethiopia or Niger where we're working, there's no rain, there's no extra water for six or eight months of the year. So there's, you know, you're, you're pumping drinking water and it's a lot of work to get it and you're not, you don't have extra water for bathing. Um, 
we, there used to be contests in the Tacoma world to see how many flies you could get on a photo, and uh, they, they've had ones with hundreds. Another part of the lore is th these muscosorbens flies preferentially breed in human feces. They've evolved along with us. They can breed in cow dung, but they're not very efficient at it. So if only we all use latrines, then these flies wouldn't breed. And there's some truth to that, because flies go up and towards light. They won't go down into a dark latrine. So we've actually done studies with uh, our Ethiopian colleagues where we've randomized communities to what the, what the Carter Center, our colleagues call latrinization. They call it intensive latrinization. Or to just, you know, the community could do what they want. If they had latrines, great. Uh, and then we looked in two years, and it made no difference whatsoever. Installing the trains will not cause trachoma to go away. Unfortunately, I wish it did. There's no vaccine that works against chlamydia currently. That's not surprising, because if you get infected with one strain, you can get reinfected with the same strain. And vaccines, it's pretty difficult for vaccines to be better than give you better protection than having recovered from the native infection. So we're left with antibiotics. And as politically incorrect as it seems, um, it's difficult to tell who's actually infected in communities, so the WHO recommends lining everyone in the community up and treating them with oral azithromycin. Now, azithromycin, you, you, we use it a lot in kids in the U.S., you probably do here. Um, it's nice because you can give it single dose, so you can line up people and you can watch them take it. If you send people home with topical tetracycline and tell them to take it for six weeks, there have been studies where you go back two weeks later and 0% of the people are still taking it. So that means that our, our um, friends in Ethiopia and Niger are just like Americans and probably like Saudis, that they're not going to be taking um, a drug consistently for something that's subclinical, that they really don't even notice that they have. Zithrom, oral azithromycin, you can give single dose. We give a, gr a gram for adults or the 20 milligrams per kilogram for children. It's, we used to say 95% effective at eliminating chlamydia in an individual. It's probably more like 85, 90. Minimal side effects, you can get a stomach ache, you can get some diarrhea, like an antibiotic, but uh, uh, it's pretty safe. Remember, it's single dose, so even where the liver function tests to, to go up, they would go down and, and you wouldn't even notice. We wouldn't even know when to test for it. Um, C. diff has not been a problem with single dose azithrom oral azithromycin. Uh, there's been no antibiotic resistance in chlamydia. There has been in other organisms, for example, pneumococcus the, uh, that's living in the back of the, colonizing the nose of all these kids. So resistance is an issue, but so far not an issue with chlamydia. That may not be that much of a surprise. We all think, oh, bacteria are going to become resistant to any drug we use, which may be true. But remember, syphilis is still resistant to penicillin. And uh, for some reason, chlamydia is still resistant. Is to, uh, syphilis is still sensitive to, susceptible to penicillin. Chlamydia is still susceptible to the macrolides, including azithromycin. So uh, the real question that I think is really, I think is really interesting, even if we're not caring for these patients very much in our clinic anymore, is should we be trying to control this disease, eliminate it, or eradicate it? Um, and let me show you what might each of those, uh, epidemiologists, by the way, have very special definitions for each of these. Control means, let's bring it to a low level where it's probably not going to be a public health concern, it still may cause an occasional case of blindness, but it's not a public health concern. Eliminate and eradicate are synonyms in English. But the, for the epidemiologist, eliminate means get rid of the infection locally in a geographical area. Eradicate means get rid of it on the planet. So that's the difference between eliminate and eradicate. Now let me show you what each of these might look like with antibiotics, with mass antibiotics. Time is on the x-axis and percent of prevalence of infection in children in the y-axis. So this is a make-believe community, kind of like the one I showed you in Egypt, though, where half the kids are infected. You treat, you try to treat everybody, you don't get everybody. Not everybody's there that day. The drug's not perfect anyway. So it comes back, but you treat every year. So you control the disease. This generation may not go blind because it's, there's a lot less burden of infection than the previous generation. So this is what control would look like. Now, if you're, if you're talking about control, you have to say, wait a minute, there's, you don't have an end strategy here. There's no into this? Are you going to be giving antibiotics forever? 
So then you've got to think, are antibiotics good or are antibiotics bad? That's a tough question. You could ask, is resistance an issue? I already told you chlamydia didn't become resistant. Here's chlamydia, but uh, here's some pneumococcus, and it does become resistant. And I'll go through, I'll skip this, but basically, if you look in communities uh, around the world at how much macrolide use there is and how much pneumococcal resistance there is, it's a nice regression there. The more macrolides you use, the more uh, resistance there is to macrolides amongst pneumococcus. No surprise there. The only surprise is our programs are going to be giving this much, or in some case, twice a year this much. So initially, people in the program were saying, oh, don't worry about it. Resistance isn't going to be a problem. But boy, it looks like it should be a problem. And uh, indeed, it is. We did a study which, uh, in the interest of time, I won't dwell on too much, but we treated kids every three months for a year. Uh, we did nasopharyngeal swabs at the beginning of the end, and uh, this is time, beginning of the year, the end of the year, this is percent of resistance. It went way up, not surprisingly. Um, the communities that weren't treated, it was still low. So it wasn't just that there was a lot of resistance overall in the area, it was that we were selecting for it. We didn't select for any, uh, the, the drugs they use in uh, many of the trachoma endemic areas are not macrolides. They're not erythromycin. They're certainly not azithromycin, which until recently has been a fairly expensive drug. They're penicillins, sulfas, tetracyclines, chloramphenicol, fluoroquinolones a lot. And uh, we caused no resistance in any of those categories. Uh, but we did cause a lot of pneumococcal resistance. And here's another study. We treated every six months. Almost no pneumococcal macrolide resistance in the beginning. 75% of the strains, pneumococcus, was resistant by three years. We stopped treating, and it went away. We wanted to wait longer because there was no more chlamydia in the area at the time, but the trachoma program said we have all this azithromycin that we've been, that's been donated, we're going to treat. And we couldn't stop them from retreating, so I don't really know what happened after here. But presumably it would have gone da back down to baseline. So yes, we are causing resistance in other organisms. We think when the program's over, that resistance should disappear. So antibiotics can be bad, there's no question. What about are antibiotics good? Well, that's a pretty hard question to answer. Um, we could say, do they affect mortality? In some of our larger trachoma programs where we've uh, randomized communities to azithromycin or to nothing for a year and see how they did, in one study of 66,000 people, uh, it turns out that in the treated communities, the childhood mortality rate was 8.4 per thousand person years. And in this area of Ethiopia, that's about what we expected. That's not one of the higher areas in the world, by the way. That's kind of a moderate level for sub-Saharan Africa. In the azithromycin-treated communities, it was half that. So who knows, maybe giving oral azithromycin, um, even though it's exactly what we were taught not to do in medical school, to give antibiotics nonspecifically, but maybe if you go to these communities where they're not getting antibiotics at all, you can actually reduce mortality. We're now retesting this in a large Gates-funded study in Niger, Malawi, and Tanzania. We're about halfway through that study. Um, but that's not a trachoma study, that's a childhood mortality study. But when you're talking about are antibiotics bad, are antibiotics good, I, if we have to give them for a long time, I don't know the answer to that. I would say it's complicated. I say they do some bad things, but they may actually do some good things. Um, well, what would local, what would elimination look like? So that's what control would look like. Yeah, we know we can control it. It doesn't become resistant, but we know we're causing resistance in organisms. Maybe we're reducing childhood mortality. It's hard to tell. What would local elimination look like? Well, same scenario. Half the kids are infected. You treat. This time we'll treat twice a year. So we'll treat. So the amount it comes back each year is less than the amount it goes down when we treat. And maybe in theory you could eventually eliminate it. Um, this turns out we've, we've tested this in communities. And now these circles are an average of eight communities. And it looks like it, uh, it doesn't fit our prediction perfectly, but it basically fits it. And in six of eight of these communities, by two and a half years, we could not identify any chlamydia. We went to some of the communities and swabbed every person in the community, and we couldn't find any chlamydia by PCR. So I think local elimination, even in these 
terribly infected communities is actually possible with antibiotics. We're now trying to see whether we can eliminate infection in a larger area, but uh, local elimination to some extent is possible. What about eradication? This is the big question to me. Now, some people think that magically, if you bring infection down to a low level, it will just go away. And that sounds like wishful thinking to a lot of us. In population biology, they call this an Ali effect. And you see it with large mammals. For example, tigers, when you bring the density of, ti when the density of tigers in an area goes down to a low enough level, males and females can't find each other. They're, they reproduce less frequently, and they eventually, um, unfortunately, disappear. Now, would that same thing happen here? Chlamydia doesn't have a male and a female form, obviously. It's a bacteria. A lot of parasites do. So onchocerciasis, schistosomiasis, uh, uh, lymphatic filariasis, they think this may actually be true. They think if you bring it down to a low level, the males may not find the females or vice versa. With chlamydia, we don't know why bacteriologically that would happen. Um, but people think it would, so we, we have tested it. You think it'd be an easy thing to test, just go to a community and treat. Here's a community, this is real data, this is a real community, single community. Treat, and it goes down to here. Watched it for a year, it didn't come back. It looks like there may be an alley effect. The only problem is, this is a neighboring community. Same prevalence of baseline, same effect of the antibiotics, and for some reason it came back in that community. When we show this, people used to say, oh, well, what's different about these communities? I don't know, they look the same to me. Um, they started off the same, they had the same effect of antibiotic treatment. We think it's just sort of who infects whom afterwards and sometimes you get lucky and it goes away and sometimes you don't. If you average the eight communities that were in this study, it came back just more slowly somewhere in between. So we thought, well that's great, there's probably not an alley effect, um, we have to move on. Uh, but people said, oh, you didn't bring it down to a low enough level. You've got to treat multiple times. So in this study, we treated four times and brought it down to a very low level. These are sort of one, two, three infections in a community right here. And then we stopped treatment, and let's see if we brought it down to a low enough level so it went away. Nope. Some communities came back quickly. Some it didn't really come back very quickly like you saw before. On average, it looks like it was coming back just as you might predict, almost exponentially there. So we thought that ended it. There's no LE effect. Our colleagues from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine published this study in a single village, treated once, and it went away. So New England Journal article. And they said you only need to treat once and that we can eradicate this disease. So we thought this is a pretty important question because uh, are we going to just treat once? Should we aim for eradication or not? Our studies were flawed because we treated some communities, but neighboring communities we treated a different way. So maybe infection was coming in from neighboring communities. So we thought, let's try to do the perfect study. Let's do multiple communities, all treated the same way. No subsequent retreatment. For this study, they actually, if children had follicles, they would retreat them. So it's not quite true that they didn't retreat. Uh, we treated neighbors the same way. Oh, the multiple communities were done just so it, we couldn't get lucky with one community. We're going to take the average of a lot of communities. And we wanted to work in an area where trachoma wasn't disappearing on its own. As you know, in large areas of the world, including areas near here, um, trachoma disappeared not because of antibiotic programs, but simply just because it was, uh, there was some secular trend. Um, there was some development that caused it to go away. So we found an area of Ethiopia where it was not going away. And uh, here's what's happened. Here's what happened. These are 16 communities. This is a spaghetti plot. So each community is in gray, but then the average is in black. So we did one treatment. It went down from 45% to about 14 or 15%. Not a bad response. Single treatment got rid of two-thirds of it right there. Um, what, what happened? Did it come back? Not really. Did it go away? Not really kind of just stayed there. So this is one of those studies where you keep trying to do it perfectly and you still don't get an answer. One of our biostatisticians did some special math and there's a slight tendency for it to come back if you didn't bring it to a low level and a slight tendency for it to go away if you did, but you have to squint to see that. It's not very convincing. So um, to, to kind of conclude about whether we should do control elimination or eradication, um, I'm actually going to put that on you all. If you could humor me and with a show of hands, I've given you pretty much all the information we have. 
Um, do you think our program should be, Tacoma program worldwide should be aiming for control in the next 20 years? Local elimination and others really try to get rid of it in communities or maybe even some countries, but not expect to in all countries or go for eradication. So if you think control, humor me and raise your hand. Okay. If you think, uh, by the way, uh, the WHO is behind you because this is the WHO's goal is control. They want to reduce it to a low enough level that it's not going to cause blindness, but uh, the WHO has uh, set high goals before, for example, Leprosy 2000, and failed to meet those goals, so they're very careful now. Their goal is control with trachoma. Who thinks local elimination? Go for elimination. Don't expect to do it all over the world, but many places. I think that's pretty wise. I think you're probably close here in, in Saudi Arabia. U.S. it happened fairly recently, but did happen. And I like this one a lot. Who thinks eradication, that our goal should really be get rid of this? Um, so actually, elimination wins, but there are a few for eradication. This is where I would raise my hand. I think we really should. And the reason is we have something else going for us. Don alluded to this earlier during Grand Rounds. Uh, people said, who study leprosy say the major challenge is to determine why leprosy is disappearing before it's all gone. Now, leprosy is disappearing, but it's disappearing over centuries. It's disappearing in slow motion, unfortunately. Uh, since about the Black Plague in the 1300s, it's gradually been going down, but unfortunately it's still with us. Uh, but there's kind of an industry in trying to figure out why leprosy is going away, because it started going away long before any microbials. Uh, so there's hygiene, evolution. Um, Chassanon's hypothesis is that people move into cities, they get TB, it's related to leprosy, you get a little cross protection, maybe leprosy goes away. I like this. As it got colder uh, in Europe, they said people wore more clothes, so they didn't transmit the leprosy as much. I haven't heard the opposite hypothesis that with global warming we're going to be in trouble, uh, maybe. Um, but regardless, why is trachoma disappearing? There's also a minor industry in trying to figure out why trachoma is disappearing. There was trachoma in Saudi Arabia. It's extremely rare now. There's some scarring in the elderly. I'm not sure there are any active cases. Uh, was it hygiene? Was it clean water? Was it education? Was it electricity? Um, Dr. Kandekar showed that uh, Oman was the first country to be endemic and really to have it registered as elimination. That's thanks to his work. Um, but I don't think we know why it was errat eliminated there. Do, do, do we know why in Saudi Arabia? I think Saudi Arabia is such an interesting case because probably got all of these things fairly quickly and it, uh, Tacoma probably went along with it. We may not know. I wanted to share with you, though, uh, some photos from Ethiopia where the world's changing. This is from one of the actual poor areas of Amhara, Ethiopia. And you know, now the older brother comes and visits. He lives in the city, and he has a nice new motorcycle, even though they're living in a hut, which could have been from maybe a 1,000 years ago. And their farming hasn't really changed much, but they have a lot of electricity from the Blue Nile Falls, from, um, which is the source of 90% of Egypt's water. Um, and uh, it's not being distributed very well. For example, all this electricity is bypassing this village, but it's quickly getting to the villages. Um, so what is it that's going to make trachoma go away in Ethiopia? It's, it's, you know, development is happening there, even in the poorest areas. This is a picture of a temple in Kathmandu. Kathmandu, uh, Nepal, used to have a ton of trachoma. We have other projects now. There is no trachoma left in Nepal. There are no active cases. We've swabbed entire villages. We can't find any chlamydia. Just 20 years ago, these communities looked a little bit like the Ethiopian communities. It disappeared fairly quickly. This is a picture, uh, this is a representation of the Buddha's eyes that's common in Tibetan and Nepalese art. Tigeson, the founder of Proctor, who you heard about earlier that Dr. Tabara was talking about, says that they drew it this way because the eyelids of most of the adults were scarred. So uh, this was an area of the world that had a lot of trachoma. Now there's none. We do not know why. We were distributing antibiotics in these communities in western Nepal, wandering around, and we noticed every one of these communities had one of these shacks that sells uh, drugs. Uh, most of these are not antibiotics, but one of the shelves, I forget which one, perhaps this one, was antimicrobials. And you didn't need a prescription. If your kid had a runny nose, a cough, you'd walk up, you'd get a, a few sulfa tablets. Fluoroquinolones were just fluoroquinolones were just coming in at this point. 
they're older, they might get a few tetracyclines. They'd give a lot of amoxicillin. People were taking more antimicrobials that were effective against chlamydia from these shacks each year than we were distributing in our antibiotic program. So for all those reasons why trachoma may be disappearing, it may actually be antibiotics. Not the mass antibiotics we're given, which are, which are helping, uh, but the antibiotics the communities are just getting anyway. It's, it's curious. I don't know if we'll ever know the answer to why it's disappearing. Um, and if anybody thinks they know the answer for Saudi Arabia, I'd be very interested. Um, I wanted to end talking about mass distributions, because this is a curious tr treatment. We're talking about precision medicine more and more in the U.S., where each individual gets a different agent or a different treatment. And this is the opposite. This is going into communities, lining people up. We don't even know if they have the disease and we're treating them. And it's really been done for only a few diseases. I'm not talking about vaccines. Vaccines we do this with. But for, for, um, for pills, we in general don't. Cred A prophylaxis was the first example of this in the 19th century. So even though Cred A was an uh, obstetrician, uh, he was treating an eye disease. So it was really first for an eye disease. Um, now you know anywhere in the world, uh, kids at birth will get an antimicrobial agent to prevent not so much the neonatal chlamydia, it's really to prevent the neonatal gonorrhea, which eats right through the cornea and cause blindness. When this was introduced, uh, before it was introduced, a quarter of the blind schools in Europe were filled with kids with old gonorrhea. It all but prevented the uh, blindness from gonorrhea. So it was really a miracle treatment. Um, trachoma, onchocerciasis, vitamin A. Uh, the, the, it was originally kids were given vitamin A tablets to prevent the um, corneal melting, but it ended up reducing childhood mortality. But those four were really originally given for eye diseases. These, of course, are not eye diseases. But it's interesting that for half the diseases that we use mass distributions for, it's for the eye, or it was originally for the eye. And for the first one, it was for the eye. So we always think scientifically, ophthalmology, yes, we have our lasers, yes, we're ahead in the eye, but you know, maybe with other things, uh, medicine and neuroscience and things are ahead, are ahead of us. Mass treatments, we've been ahead of the rest of the world. So um, I ask you this question, I think elimination one. Um, I'm hoping for eradication in my career, which won't go on that much longer, so we'll see. Uh, and I just want to thank everybody. I want to thank our, um, the Carter Center, the International Common Initiative, and our colleagues in Niger and the Ministry of uh, uh, Health there. So thank you very much. More on trachoma than you wanted, but I think uh, it's an interesting public health issue in our careers. Anyone with any uh, questions or comments? I, I have a question. Has anybody in the audience seen a case of active trachoma, not the scarring in the adults, but the follicles in the younger people in Riyadh recently? How about other areas of Saudi Arabia? This disease has disappeared, hasn't it? It's amazing. You have not? Yeah. That's a good thing. Are you? Uh, thank you. I think it's very difficult to disappear. I saw one patient last week here with uh, trachoma infections in the an ophthalmic cavity. I think it's very difficult to disappear. How old? Uh, six, 60, 67, I don't remember very well. But I, I'm sure because I'm Brazilian, I, I can recognize trachoma and I recognize it. There's just a little bit left in Brazil for the rest of the audience in, uh, in certain areas, right? But uh, not much left. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>